Hello and welcome back to my crazy electronics videos. I'm going to be talking a little bit about my Megawang 2000 Turbo Edition hardware that you can see here. It's plugged into my trusty Commodore 64 bread bin, which is then connected via the user port to that board stack and it allows graphics to be rendered which look a lot like Amiga graphics. Actually better quality than Amiga graphics because it includes things like scaled sprites. It also includes four, six or eight independent screen layers that can be moved around in terms of priority. But this video is about a user port extension which is planned to provide up to several gigabytes of external memory addressable to the Commodore 64 via the user port. You might be wondering, Martin, why use the user port when the cartridge port is free? And that's because I want to keep the cartridge port free, because the cartridge port allows code execution from the cartridge RAM, for example, and this code execution can contain nice unrolled loops. This user port extension is planned to not only allow a large amount of addressable external memory, but also fast memory transfer from its internal memory to the memory on the Mega Wang 2000 Turbo Edition hardware. This would allow for extra graphical tricks. This design tool that we're looking at here is the Proteus uh, Schematic Capture design tool, and it also allows layout to be designed as well. This part of the schematic is actually the data generator. This VSM DD1 component is a data generator, which at the moment is simulating the lines SP1, SP2, the serial ATN, the PA2, and also the uh, PC write line from the user port on the Commodore 64. It does a better job at data generation than some of the original data models that were included in this Proteus design tool. The data generator can also record information. So I'm using it to record information from the various different signals inside this schematic. It doesn't provide a, a visual display like this logic analyzer, which is actually part of the Proteus design tool itself. But the recording functionality of my digital data model allows recording to text files. And then the recorded data in the text files, I can then validate later on. And I use that to validate the correct behavior of this schematic design. So while the VSM logic analyzer is good at make, having a nice little visual uh, verification, I want to use automated verification of the behavior of this schematic. So this data generator actually reads the data generator patterns from a configurable pattern file or a text file. This text file has a very simple language for describing which signals and which values are asserted at various different times on its output pins. I can supply human readable names for bit patterns to output here. So the first eight signals are the eight bit, eight bits used for a data byte. And then the ninth bit here, which is uh, data bit 8, counting from 0, corresponds to the data direction register, for example, from the Commodore 64, the SP1, SP2, serial ATN, and the PA2 signals are all named here, and they are mapped to corresponding bits. Then we get into the later part of this data generation, simple scripting language, if you like which describes the signals that get turned on or off on each line, and each line corresponds to a particular tick or a clock pulse on the input to the data generator. This input clock pulse is, I think, clocked at one megahertz. And that's because the approximate resolution of the Commodore 64's user port is also around one megahertz. Uh, say, for example, if you're writing a byte over the user port, the PC signal will go from high to low and then back to high again in the space of a couple of ticks of a one megahertz clock. It actually stays low for a one megahertz tick, basically. So I can control or I can simulate the control of the signals that I expect 
to be able to control via software on the Commodore 64 to test the functionality and the behavior of this schematic. So there's various different latches and registers within this hardware which allow the internal um, currently 24-bit memory address space to address its internal RAMs. I haven't populated the entire 24-bit address space. I've only put in a few megabytes of RAM in this design, but it's easily expandable by adding extra RAM chips and extra sockets and what have you. But basically the registers allow 24-bit address space to be initialized and then for the Commodore 64 or hopefully something else on a USB bus for example to inject data into that memory or to write data into that memory and to read it back again which is going to be important later on and also to read back the memory with certain patterns so starting at different memory addresses and adding on different offsets to the memory address every time the Commodore 64 writes or reads data in the external RAM. This means that the Commodore 64 would be able to do very fast reads, not DMA fast reads from the, from the cartridge side if you were using, like for example, the, the uh, RAM expansion with DMA capability, but it's still faster than trying to use the indexed instruction modes on the Commodore 64. So it's like a halfway house. It allows faster memory reading and writing, but not quite as fast as DMA, but still under code control. So if I'm single stepping through this simulation here, you can see the debug representation inside this memory contents window of the, uh, the debug test data from that signal or pattern file rather filling in bytes into the simulated RAM and then the internal addresses is, is for example reset and then the Commodore 64 can read back what it's written. But so this would allow uh, easy uh, any direction scrolling, any direction screen offset simply by writing large amounts of scrollable screen data to the external memory. And then the Commodore 64 can, under code control, read back that memory at different offsets and then store it back into the Commodore 64's screen memory. And it can do this from top to bottom, regardless of the direction of the scroll. Now, all of this functionality is recorded by these other digital data models which record various different signals. Some of them the UD0 to 7 signals and the address space and the PC signal. The second one for example records the um, 8 bits for the um, user port, the external user port bus and also the PC signal, PA2 signal and also has a nice little breakpoint registry there well so that if anything goes wrong within the simulation I can assert the breakpoint signal and then the data model will record that. Uh, this one here is recording uh, writes to the external memory so that it notes down what the data byte is and also what the corresponding memory addresses are. Anyway, so what this allows the Commodore 64 do, to do is to read this external memory at, at various different offsets and memory addresses and uh, address patterns, if you like, and store them in a very linear fashion from top left to bottom right, including the color memory all at the same time, so that you don't need to scroll the screen data using a double buffer. You can have a single screen buffer so if you have a look at my Parallax scrolling video, for example, or some of the Commodore 64 games, you know that most games use a double buffer for their screen. And that's because usually there isn't enough frame time for the Commodore 64 to update a full screen uh, without tearing or anything like that. So you have to use a double buffer. With this expansion, it's possible to scroll the entire screen plus color data with color data changing for every single character, all in one screen, in any direction. In fact, at any 
offset within this large virtual um, external RAM address space. So this means the screen can be in one place and then the next basically the next frame the screen can be displaying uh, data in a completely different area of the map and that's because the screen can be drawn from top to bottom left to right so basically chasing the raster beam down the screen now ideally you would want to do this kind of screen scrolling uh, just as you are getting to the bottom part of the border and that's where you can start the logic for the next display so the copy would start there and you can copy the entire two kilobytes of data easily within one frame and also allow time for multiplexing. So to help validate all of this behavior, I make use of my uh, QX Plus BDD6502 based testing framework, which allows various different test scenarios for automation to be described. So this first scenario basically runs the Proteus design Tool. The second scenario then validates expected values within the uh, RAM write uh, recorded file that's recorded by the data model from the simulation when it's running. So it validates that there's an expected address and it validates that there is the expected byte value being written to the memory. The next test scenario, for example, validates that uh, the pass through signals are operating as expected uh, when the uh, circuit, when the simulated circuit has uh, gone through its, or during its power on reset signal, so uh, reset cycle. So when the Commodore 64 is trying to send data during a power on reset, for example, it makes sure that the output signals are in accordance with the designed behavior. There, there's a scenario here for testing the fast DMA, for example. So the fast DMA is something which transfers the external memory from this expansion to the MegaWang board stack. So running the test runs the Proteus design suite there that we saw there, and then it runs through all of the data and behavioral verifications of all of these test scenarios. And then once the test scenario line uh, succeeds in, in executing, then it, it marks it in the editor as green. So I have a very quick visual indication of where the successes are and also if there are any problems. So problems are highlighted, so for example, in red rather than green. I also can see from the command line window there that there are 12 scenarios executed with 197 test steps in those scenarios and all of them succeeded. I can also have a look at a little uh, HTML based report as well if I wanted to and of course there are no red failures because all of the tests succeeded. So I tend to use this kind of automated validation even for my uh, crazy electronics hardware projects because automated validation is a lot quicker and easier than ma uh, manual validation. Once I'm happy with the schematic, I can go into the board layout. Now the board hasn't been completely populated. I have populated the RAM chips in the middle and some of the connectors around the edge, but the rest of the components have not been placed yet. We can see that the green lines here represent the rat's nest of uh, signal connectivity between the various different pins and parts of the connectors, but the rest of the board hasn't been populated yet. That's because I tend to use automatic placement and I tend to then use automated routing for most of the signals on board. That's because I like to rapidly prototype and iterate on prototypes and doing manual placement and manual routing is time consuming and error prone. I tend to trust the auto placer and auto router for most of the job. Some of it I don't, that's why I pre-placed the connectors on the edge and the RAM chips in the middle. This is also why I have these uh, dotted rectangles in, what is it, light blue or cyan or something like that, which are basically keep out areas for auto placement. I want to have these areas in the board 
open so that there's enough space for signal routing, for example. But generally speaking, generally speaking, I'm content to let the auto placer do its thing. There we go, it's finished the auto place. And there's a lot of green rat's nest wires from the unconnected signals. So now we use the auto router to route as best as it can. I can see it's having a little bit of trouble with one remaining a little conflict smack bang in the middle of the board on one of the uh, legs of the one of the RAM chips, uh, the first RAM chip on the left. We'll just let it run through to see if it can resolve those conflicts or that was one single conflict rather without any missing connections. It should be able to rescue the situation. And there we go, the final cleanup, cleanup pass worked. Uh, there are no DRC errors. All of the legs on those RAM chips are connected. And that's what the place and routed board looks like. There are no design rule errors. And let's have a look what it looks like in the 3D visualizer. So the red boxes are uh, some little headers, which they're basically missing models. Uh, but most of the components, most of the connectors, uh, I have models for in this tool. So the board looks pretty much like it would do if I ordered it today from PCBWay. And uh, it arrived nice and assembled. So the component in the bottom left is not a spider. It's going to be a can oscillator. So the can oscillator can be in two different sizes depending on the speed. And I just have enough space in there to have a small square can oscillator or a larger rectangular can oscillator. That's the end of this video. If you like these kind of like crazy electronics projects that I'm working on for expanding video and audio capability of the Commodore 64 and also other retro 8-bit retro games machines then please do consider liking or subscribing to my channel and I hope to catch you around next time. Have a great day wherever you are.